John, that's some pretty important, heavy topics have been covered today. Should we lighten it up a little? Yeah, I really think we should, Jeff. Uh, this morning I experienced my first L.A. earthquake. And had I known it, at Dairy Queen, we have a brownie earthquake treat. So I think you all would have enjoyed the brownie earthquake a whole lot more than what we woke up to. Well, I know you couldn't bring us a brownie earthquake, but did you bring anything? Well, Jeff, I think right now we're going to soften everybody up. I see dilly bars coming out we in the audience. got them coming? Here's, here's the bad news. Because we're behind on time, I think they're eliminating a break. Is that right, Chris? The good, new, the good news is you're going to get your dilly bars now. So, All right, John, let's talk, let's talk about Dairy Queen and the brand and the great work that you've done. Um, Dairy Queen's a pretty magical brand, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, Jeff. We're a 74-year-old brand, and when you think of Dairy Queen, everybody has great memories because it really is a brand that appeals to families. Yeah. Well, there are some challenges, though. I want to do a quick, quick survey here. So everybody in the audience, if you've ever been to a Dairy Queen, please raise your hand. Wow. That's almost 100%, That's isn't it? All right, everybody who has really fond memories of Dairy Queen when you went, raise your hand. It's even better, Jeff. All right, keep your hands up. Everybody who's been to Dairy Queen in the last 30 days, keep your hand up. There's our challenge. There's the opportunity. There's our challenge. <laughs> All right. Well, may, maybe the dilly bars will get people, uh, get their appetites wet. Well, you know, Jeff, uh, we'll talk a little bit later, but Dairy Queen is much more than ice cream. And I think that's one of the challenges, are trying to get people to visit our locations more frequently. We were asked to come here today to talk about an idea that we worked on as an agency with the client that really transcends advertising and started to get to the essence of the brand and started to change the culture of an organization. So the first time you were exposed to this idea, I think it was in seeing that video in the pitch, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, Jeff. You know, we're a 74-year-old brand, and Barclay is actually only our third advertising agent. Hey, how about that? We wish there were more clients yeah. like that. Well, we hope that trend continues, John. Well, keep doing good work. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeff, when I first saw the, we call it the manifesto, I mean, it just told me this is really what our brand is all about. I mean, we are a franchisor. Out of our almost 6,500 stores, we only own and operate three. So our franchisees are actually our customers, and this is what our, our franchisees believe the brand really stands for. Talk about, John, talk about the uniqueness of the Dairy Queen system. It's a very diverse brand. There are a lot of different store types. And, and so one of the things that you had asked for is an idea that would really unify a very diverse system. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, we started off as a treat-only concept that served great soft serve. But over the years, our system has grown. We have a variety of stores. We own Orange Julius, uh, which is about an 88-year-old brand. And we operate our grill and chill restaurants, which are a full quick service unit. So we needed an idea that would transcend across all concepts. One of the things that is probably, this has probably been one of the most rewarding things I've been associated with in my career, because as an industry, uh, we create a lot of ideas. And it's very rare that a client and a CEO of that client embraces an idea and really drives it down into the culture of the organization. So let's talk a little bit about the impact that this platform has had on the culture at Dairy Queen? Sure. Well, you know, it was kind of ironic that when we went out to do a review of agencies, we were actually doing quite well as a brand. Our sales were positive, but we just felt that we didn't have a North Star, an idea that could really rally our, our brand around it. And we were looking for an idea that wasn't a marketing and advertising idea, but something that actually fit in with our mission, vision, values. And two of our values at Dairy Queen are appreciate heritage and embrace change. So we needed something that would transcend both of those values. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about, before we actually introduced the public to this idea, we did a pretty extensive internal marketing campaign, starting with the corporation and then going out to the field with the franchisees. 
Talk a little bit about how we started to roll this out internally and how you started to embed this into the culture. Sure. Well, yeah, I think the audience needs to know that this really wasn't an idea for a campaign. The research showed that the truth was that Dairy Queen had fans. And that's how fan food, not fast food, really uh, emerged. But we liked the idea so much that, I mean, it really speaks to who we are as a brand that we decided to rally our corporate staff, all of our franchisees, and now our fans, our customers around the concept. So we started off, we had a big kickoff meeting up at our corporate headquarters in Minneapolis, and everybody had a red T-shirt, and we're out in the parking lot, photographer up on the roof, and we spelled fan food. Now, it seems like a really simple concept, but we sent that picture out to all of our franchisees around the world, especially in the US and Canada, and said, this is more than a marketing idea. We then, at the corporate headquarters, actually raised the fan food flag. And if you come by our headquarters, you'll see the US flag, the Minnesota flag, and fan food. And it's really a flag that our system raised to say it's all about serving our fans. There was one more step that you took as well, which was really asking everybody in the system, both at the corporate office level and out in the field, to literally take an oath. Talk about that. Yeah, I got to tell you, when we first started talking about the oath, I'm thinking, will people really rally behind this? Because you know, it seemed like an idea that some people might say, you know, why? But it's an oath that really all of our corporate employees and our franchisees are pledging to make the very best soft serve, the very best food, the very best beverages, and provide the best service to our fans. So we had everyone actually sign it. You'll see the picture there. And most recently in Hawaii at our convention, we had over 2,000 people hold up the mighty red spoon and repeat the oath. And it really was a, a pretty cool moment. Well, I think it's a real testament to you and your leadership team for embracing and driving that down. And so one of the things that we did recently also, as you know, to try to see the impact we were having at the field, because as we all know, an, an idea that we come up with in a boardroom, and even an idea that you can get your team in Minneapolis to rally around, it's great, but it's pretty meaningless until it translates to the restaurant level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have IDQ, as a customer, but more importantly, our franchisees are really the customer of our agency. So it was really important that the campaign would resonate with the franchisees. I've got to tell you, when you hear your franchisees talking about fan food, not fast food, the way they do in the video, that's when I knew that we really had the truth and that we were really on to a big idea. Yeah, that's great. So. I think really the, the, the importance of this idea is how it impacted culture, but we do have an audience of ad people. So should we look at some of the ads as well? So, uh, so I am curious in, in, in front of this audience to, I haven't really asked you, how do you like the advertising? Uh, <laughs> well, I agreed to come to LA to meet with you here. So, you so, know, it must so be pretty well, okay. good, but no. We're, we're off to a great start. We're really proud of it. And, and that's the most important thing. We are very proud of our brand, and we want to be proud of our advertising, and we are. I think most importantly uh, has been the response from the franchise community. I would agree. Why don't we take a look at some of the work. The first, the first ad, one, one of the things that's also unique about the way you guys approached the launch of this new platform to consumers is the, the QSR category is very heavily promotionally driven, and we certainly do our share of that. But what you guys asked us to do out of the gates with this campaign was find a way to really connect the essence of this brand to consumers at an emotional level. We asked your team to come up with something to kick off our campaign. And it really wasn't geared at selling any one product. It really was to set the stage for what was to follow. Yep. Well, you talked earlier about, and, and when we did the survey, we saw that while a lot of people go to Dairy Queen, a lot of people love Dairy Queen, People aren't going as often as we would like. We're in a highly competitive category, and the brand's really transitioning from its heritage as a treat destination to a food destination. So we know that people eat treats occasionally, 
But people have to eat lunch every day, don't they? Absolutely. We have been able to take our great soft serve, combine it with our great food at a great value, and it's been one of the most successful promotions we've ever had at Dairy Queen. That's great. And as we start to transition the brand to being known more for food, we still want to maintain our treat dominance. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the ownership of the organization. So for those in the audience who may not know, Berkshire Hathaway acquired the Dairy Queen brand in 1998. So can you talk about the uniqueness and the, uh, how it is to be owned by Berkshire Hathaway? And I think you report directly to Warren Buffett, don't you? So, so what's he like as a boss? Well, I, I do report to Warren, but before I get to Berkshire, Jeff, uh, I think this audience needs to know it's not only about great advertising, but it's about driving results for your customers. That's the most important thing. I heard one of the other speakers this morning talk about metrics, and it's very important that you understand the strategy of whatever customer you're working with and then help them drive sales results. And Jeff, I'm really pleased since the campaign uh, kicked off, you know, we've had positive same store sales and that makes a lot of people happy, including Warren Buffett. Yep, makes me pretty happy too. Well, that's good. <laughs> but no, so, I, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of, of calling Warren my boss. And uh, Warren bought Dairy Queen in 1998. And I've heard Warren tell many stories about why he bought Dairy Queen. But the one I remember the most is Warren claims that uh, when he was a younger man, he, he took a young lady to Dairy Queen and treated her to uh, a Dairy Queen treat. And of course, she enjoyed it. And as Warren said, if someone like the young lady would enjoy Dairy Queen, why well, ought to buy it? And for <laughs> many of you in the audience. If you're Warren Buffett, I guess you can do that. Well, yeah, you know, Warren uh, likes to invest in companies that he knows and that he understands. And one of the challenges that he gives all of his managers, and, and my challenge at Dairy Queen, is to expand the moat. And in our case, we have a brand called the Blizzard, which is about a $1.8 billion brand within Dairy Queen. And our objective is to expand that moat, not only with great treats like the Blizzard, but expand our food business as well. I think we have a picture of Warren. So tell me about his involvement. I mean, obviously he's running a huge organization with a lot of holdings. So what's it like? How, I mean, like, how do you interact with him? Well, the, the beauty of it is Warren is the biggest fan of Dairy Queen. He loves Dairy Queen. And everything you read about Warren and, and how he works with the companies, he actually entrusts the management of Dairy Queen to myself and the guidance that we're given is to protect the Dairy Queen brand and to protect the Berkshire Hathaway brand. But Warren is, is probably the biggest cheerleader that any brand could have. To kick off our new campaign of fan food, not fast food, last spring I invited Warren to dinner. So I figured I could take Warren and buy him a five buck lunch <laughs> at a DQ grill and chill. You're a big spender. Well, I knew Warren <laughs> would enjoy it. So we went out, we bought Warren a five buck lunch, and we had Warren serve the very first blizzard of summer. And last year we launched a blockbuster blizzard called the S'mores. Yep. So I think you might have a clip of that. You know, it just so happens, I do. <laughs> You know, Jeff, the audience probably didn't pick up on it, but Warren's tie is a old Dennis the Menace <laughs> Dairy Queen tie from a campaign that goes back many years ago. But Warren mentioned in there that he learned how to turn a blizzard upside down in Beijing. Two years ago, we had the honor to host Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Charlie Munger in Beijing, China. Wow. And Warren is such a great sport. He did a grand opening for us because, you know, we have almost 600 stores in China now. That's great. 
Well, I know you just got back from Asia, didn't you? I did. I just got back uh, the end of last week. Very good. Well, I want to shift gears again, and there's been a lot of talk today. There's been a lot on the, the topic of corporate citizenship. And I know that that's a, a topic that is very passionate to you and that you're very focused, focused on as an organization. So we heard a panel of, of, of great presenters talk about what their companies are doing in that area. Why don't you talk a little about what Dairy Queen's doing? Yeah, Jeff, it's really important that corporations and individuals that work for corporations give back to the communities. In the case of Dairy Queen, we've had about a 29-year relationship with Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And Children's Miracle Network Hospitals is made up of individual hospitals. Uh, I believe the system is uh, pushing 170. And we've raised $100 million during the time that we've been affiliated with CMNH. That's pretty incredible. And you know, it's a lot of help from great fans in the audience, I'm sure, out here. Uh, we sponsor Miracle Treat Day every summer where uh, proceeds are donated from selling blizzards. But it, it really, truly is important that corporations give back to their communities. And with Dairy Queen being a family brand, and with children being so important to our brand, that's why Children's Miracle Network Hospitals and Dairy Queen is just a great fit. Well, last night at dinner we were talking about, or at, at, even today we were talking about some of your favorite memories, and there's a, there's a story associated to Children's Miracle Network that's very personal to you and very personal to the brand. Would you mind sharing that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. We have a Dairy Queen operator up in Vancouver, British Columbia, <clears throat> whose daughter was fighting leukemia. Uh, Lindsay Lorenko uh, put up a fight for many, many years. Actually, um, two and a half years ago, I had Lindsay speak to our international convention at Dairy Queen. Uh, Lindsay lost her battle this past year to leukemia. And we've created a, a new award, the Lindsay Lorenko Beacon of Courage Award, to honor just an uh, unbelievable young lady. But sometimes you get touched in life by just amazing people. And many times, it's children. Yeah. And so I think that has been a real rallying point for uh, both myself as well as our franchisees to want to really get out there and raise even more money for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Great. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. All right, so we have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to do some final rapid-fire questions for you, if that's OK. OK. All right, so just getting back from Asia, and I know Dairy Queen is now in 25 countries? 25 countries the plus the US and Canada. OK, 25 plus the US and Canada. As you've been out there and expanding the brand, what are some of the areas of the world that you think have the biggest potential right now for restaurants and retailers that are US-based? Well, China is still a big market despite the weakening in the economy. But as I mentioned, we have 600 units already in China. Thailand is another good market. We have 370 units. But one of the markets I'm very excited about is Vietnam. We just opened our first two units in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, last week, we had the opportunity to visit. Uh, we should have 10 units open by the end of the year. And we really believe that will be one of our next, what we call, frontier markets. Great. Very good. All right, so there are a lot of CEOs in the room. You're a CEO I definitely look up to and admire. What advice would you give to other CEOs in terms of the two or three key leadership traits you think it takes to be successful? Well, I had an opportunity to hear uh, a few other speakers today. And I've already heard this said, but I really believe it's the most important thing. And that is to listen. Uh, not only if you're a, a CEO, but if you're an agency wanting to come in and, and work with a client, you, it's too easy for all of us to speak. And if we can improve our listening skills and really understand what the organization needs and wants, uh, we can do a much better job. The other thing I think a CEO needs to be focused on is the development of talent. Uh, in our case, we're a franchisor. We don't own a lot of restaurants. So the most valuable resource that I have on my team is my people. And we saw a presentation today about millennials. Uh, the millennial employees are looking for things maybe much differently than what I was looking for when I came up in my career. And companies need to adapt their thinking. So that coupled with strategic planning. 
uh, it really is the role of the CEO to provide that vision for the organization. And too often, it's uh, easy to get trapped in managing details. So you really need to look out and provide that vision to the organization. Great. Well, you may have just partially answered my last question, but you, you made a comment, and I think if you missed it in the room, uh, you know, Dairy Queen as, a, as an organization has been around 74 years, and we're only their third agency. And I think that's you know, a tremendous show of patience and commitment to the client agency partnership. So you're highly qualified to answer the question, what do you think are the key ingredients to successful client agency relationships? Well, I, I said one of the keys to being a CEO is to listen. It, same holds true for agencies. Yeah. They need to come in and they need to understand the strategies of the company. It's not about coming up with a great ad campaign. It's about figuring out how you become a resource to help that company achieve their objectives. And I think the more work that's done on the front end to understand what the company is trying to achieve, then an agency can play a very, very big role. And many of us are always looking for more resources. And our agency partners definitely have access to a lot of resources. Great. Did everybody enjoy their daily bars? All right. Good. Well, on behalf of the four A's, this is a big deal to take the time to do this, and we really do appreciate it. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah.